Hey Metro, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Jeff Mitchell. And uh, now listen, it's pretty obvious. Jeff isn't half the man uh, that I am. And I could probably beat you at pretty much any competition we oh, have out come there. Come on, Pastor Boy. <laughs> he calls <laughs> me Pastor Boy. Uh, but Jeff, you know, we talk about this idea of a comeback, right? And uh, how everybody needs a comeback in some areas of life. And, and one of the big areas that's been a turnaround for you, a comeback for you, is this um, is this area of health? Uh, you yeah. uh, you were once not the spitting image of a guy that you are now. Uh, That's there true. was a time I've yeah. seen the pictures and uh, oh my goodness, uh, you are a different man today. Yeah. I am. And uh, so things have changed. So why don't you take us back uh, to some of those early years and how did you get from where you were to you know becoming a man where you go? I got to change something. Well. You know, I was in, uh, I was a fat kid, you know, I was chubby and had the husky sizes, you know, I don't know if everybody remembers the husky size. Oh yeah. I had husky and, uh, you know, I threw, uh, elementary school, middle school. I was just, I was a heavy kid. Got into high school, started liking girls, you know, so I went on a starvation diet, yeah. right? Lost a lot of weight. So I got down, you know, to an, I think I was like 190 in high school, whatever, oh. you know and uh six foot right six foot yeah six two 190 so oh, i was yeah, lean pretty thin, yeah. yeah and uh maybe 195 or something like that but i was lean you know and uh you know after high school uh things got out of control a little bit you know because yeah. it was it was a problem my eating was a problem yeah. that i had uh had to deal with at some point so my whole life was up and down lose weight gain weight lose yeah. weight gain weight the whole time and eventually after high school you you know people always gained the 15 pounds after high school but it was way more than that for you where, where did you end up so i was uh my max was like 305 yeah. so big boy about nine, 85 to 90 pounds heavier than i am right now yeah so and and it wasn't just from food it was your whole life started right. to slide That's tell us right. about that a little bit so i got i got saved and uh god just kept knocking these things out of my life that he kept convicting me. And so tell us about this. Well, you know, I had a drinking problem, eating problem, porn problem. They're all combined together, really. It and was you a started downward drinking spiral. pretty heavy. Well, I was a heavy drinker, right? From uh, age 15, I started heavily drinking. Wow. And food went right along with it with yeah. me. And, and you uh, put those two things together, the calories add bad. up, and just the whole mindset of not caring about yourself that's adds right. Up, right. That's right. It was, uh, I had no regard for health. It, it wasn't even in the back of my mind. It was, yeah. I felt I was a little invincible to be honest with yeah. you. Like nothing's going to really hurt me. You're young, young yeah. and stupid really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not only your health, it's your soul, right? I mean, there, you had very little regard for who you were becoming as a man. No, didn't even think about it. To what be changed? Well, Jesus came into my life is what yeah. changed. That's what really changed. So I got sober. Uh, and that began this whole process of God changing me yeah. one step at a time. It was alcohol, porn, knocked out next. And then the last major area for my life was my health. Yeah. And, uh, it, it took another five or six years after I got sober to actually, wow. for God to convict me there. Wow. Very cool. Uh, and what was that like? You decided to start working on your health. Was it an overnight thing? And all of a sudden you're perfectly in control of your diet, your exercise, your life, your habits. Uh, what did that look like for you? Well, after high school, it was up and down a lot. Gain, lose, gain, lose. And then uh, I remember specifically the day I was on a cruise. I weighed 305. I'm not kidding. I was laying by the pool reading my Bible. And this whole feeling came over me. And God was said, what are you doing to your body? Wow. What are you doing to your body? I bless you with all this health. So I was still relatively healthy. Nothing bad had happened yet. What are you doing? And then just, I was convicted right then and there. Yeah. I got off the ship that few days later. Did you pick out for the rest of the ship? Tommy? Yeah. I yeah. Think good I did. man. You might as well get your money. I worth. think I yeah, did. I, I, I. But I knew something had changed in me. Actually, I was eating kind of with guilt though. Then <laughs> the rest of the cruise, to be honest with you. Yeah. And then it began a journey for you. Yep. I got off the ship and I knew something changed in me yeah. that that hadn't happened before with my health. And I was going to make some radical, radical changes yeah. with my health. 
And so eating and exercise and reading and thinking and feeding your soul, it all changed. It all, it all came together. And I actually applied my health with Jesus's help. I'd never done that yeah. before. I did it with alcohol. I did it with porn. I never did it with my health. Yeah. And that was my next step that God wanted me to take. Wow. And now you are one of the people around here trying to encourage other people with health. You've led Metro Fit. You've done our uh, weight loss boot camps, and you have just helped so many people uh, on their journey. So, Jeff, way to go, man. That is a comeback worth talking about. Yeah, it's uh, been a great journey. It's yep. been a great journey. I'm very passionate about it these days Yeah, because I know how much better people can feel yeah. just by taking care of their health. Yeah, keep it up. Thank you. Come on, Metro, give it up for life change. Absolutely, come on, come on, come on. That's a big deal. That's awesome. Uh, hey, I'm Pastor Kevin, one of the staff pastors here at the church, and I am so glad to be with you right now. Uh, whether you are here in person or, or uh, by video, so glad you're here. I wanna start with a, a quick story. Um, my first, first car accident I was ever in, I was 12 years old. And, and my older brother was 19, and he was the one driving. So naturally, the 19-year-old wants to impress the 12-year-old. And, and like the smart 12-year-old brother, I knew his tendencies. So I buckled up in the back, obviously, in the middle, away from the doors. And it served me very well this evening. Because, because I don't know how this happened, but, but we end up uh, coming alongside this, this Camaro, and, and, and God bless my brother, he drove a Ford Taurus. And uh, you know, when you're 19, a Taurus can do anything. It can be a Camaro. And he drove it like it was. And, and I don't know, but we're going and, and we're racing this Camaro. And the Camaro is ahead of us most of the time. And, and my brother watches, he watched a lot of NASCAR. So like he, he kind of like knows a few things here and there. He likes to think he does, we'll say that. And, and so we, we come around this corner and we, we were gonna go to my house where my mom lived and I live with my mom. And, and the road to my mom's house wasn't just an easy like turn or, or an eventual turn. It went up a hill, like instantly up a hill. And so you can already tell this is not going to go well right now. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you the story. And my brother whips around this Camaro and, and, he, and, and he sees my road coming up and he cuts in front of the Camaro and thinking he can continue to just go on up the hill. Uh, that did not happen, actually. He started to go up the hill, but he didn't quite make it. And wouldn't you know it, all of a sudden, I feel lighter. And all of a sudden, I see nickels and candy hitting the ceiling because we're going upside down because we had flipped off this hill. And I couldn't believe it. And it was like this, this amazing moment. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, wear your seatbelts. And, and so we, we crash and we crawl out and that Camaro turns around and comes back. You know, they had the decency to check on us. And, and so it's, it's pitch black, dark outside, but we could still see all the smoke rolling out when they opened the doors. It was not cigarette smoke, by the way. Uh, and, and, and this like, you know, hillbilly gets out. He goes, hey, anybody dead? <laughs> so we're like, uh, no, no, we're, we're okay, you know? And so he's like, okay, well, we're gonna get out of here before the cops come. Have a good night, you know. And they just hop in and leave. And so, well, that was, that, was, that was like nuts. It was absolutely nuts. But I tell you that story because while I was still hanging upside down, before I unbuckled my seatbelt and hit the ceiling, which is just weird to say, but while I'm hanging there, I'm 12 years old, but I have this moment where I think to myself, wow, life is so fragile. Like, like it just hits me and it sinks in like never before. And so maybe you've had these moments in your life as well where you just like have this, this, this epiphany where you're like, wow, I'm not invincible. Wow, like I don't have it all together. Life is so delicate, just like that. Maybe, maybe you were holding like a newborn baby, you know, minutes old and you're just blown away by how fragile it is. Or maybe you were in a car accident, you witnessed a car accident, something just shifted inside of you. Maybe you were holding hands with someone when they died, when, when they passed away, and you were the last person that they heard from. You were the last person they saw. And you just have this moment where you are just blown away by how delicate life is. And so the Bible actually has a bit to say about this. 
And uh, specifically in the book of James, and, and James is Jesus' little brother, just so you know. In James chapter four, this won't be our big text tonight, but I think it's really important to kind of hit home in this, this uh, part right here. It says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Listen, I really like the comeback series. I, I, I like what we're doing here and talking about how we can come back in different situations and in different topics. And what what I really like about it is that at some point you're going to connect to something. At some point, something will resonate with you. And, and for me, I probably, I probably have the most sensitive and offensive topic to talk about this entire series. Thanks, Pastor Jeremy. <laughs> Out of town. <laughs> yeah, I know what that means. But I do, I want to talk to you about your health but I want to talk about it in a few different ways, so don't dismiss me or, or go to the bathroom never to return. Just, just stick with me for a moment because I want to walk through the fact that your health matters. Yes, your physical health matters. Your mental health matters. Your emotional health, your, your spiritual health, your well-being matters to God, and in fact, you honor God in taking it seriously. And so I want to walk through with you some, some spiritual principles that have incredible implications for us and for our lives. And the reality is that they all affect each other. They're not different avenues that never cross. They do cross. And what happens to one has a ripple effect. It affects all of them. And so stick with me here because I'm about to prove this to you. Because in Galatians, it talks about spiritual fruit. Notice it didn't say spiritual McDonald's, like a McDouble. Like, like, it's, like it's like, no, fruit, because it's healthy. Fruit. So, so, so go with me for a moment. In Galatians, it talks about spiritual fruit. And I want to show you this, because I think you'll, you'll really get this. And I think it'll mean a lot to you if you actually see this in person. And so Galatians 5 it's, it, it talks about all these different spiritual fruits, nine different fruits. And the first one it talks about is love. Love is small, but it's, it's big, right? Love, love, that matters. Love, and we have joy, the fruit of joy. That matters. Love and joy. And now we have peace. Peace, I like peace on top of my salad, actually. So we got peace. It's funny, y'all can laugh. Come on, this is church, you gotta have fun. Uh, then we have kindness, kindness, kindness matters, uh, patience, I'm getting a little out of order, but you all are, are tracking with me, patience right here, and, and come on, come on, there's, there's another one in here, oh, goodness, goodness, oh man, I'm a sucker for a mango too, so this is really good, uh, faithfulness, faithfulness matters as well, and if I can, I can pull it out, naturally, this is gentleness, Gentleness. And we really like all of these fruits of the Spirit, right? We like all of these fruits of the Spirit, all eight of these. But the reality is, we like eight of them. We don't give a lot of attention to the ninth one. And honestly, because we don't give enough attention to it, the ninth one looks like this. And we forget about it. And it just kind of loses it's hold in our life. It's influence in our life. That is self-control. Self-control. We really don't give it the attention it deserves. We cherish the first eight, but we don't talk about self-control. When was the last time you heard a sermon on self-control? On discipline. Because discipline is divine. Honestly, honestly, I think self-control is the forgotten fruit. It's something that we just don't think much of because here in the United States, we're blessed with many things, but I think a negative effect is that we want what we want when we want it and we want it right now. That's the American dream. And that's, that's where we are. And so I think we've, we've really fallen out of step with self-control because we have everything offered to us. 
Everything is offered to us now. And so I want, to be, I want to take you through a Bible story in Genesis 25. And this is where we're really mostly going to stay for the rest of our time together. And I want this topic of, self, of self-control to be in the back of your mind as we walk through this story. And, and as we walk through this story, I want you to be thinking of the spiritual, the mental, the emotional, and the physical implications that a lack of self-control will have in your life. And so our text is in Genesis 25, and uh, specifically in verse 29 is where we're going to start, but let let me catch you up before we hop right into this. Uh, So we have Isaac and Rebecca. They came together, they're married, they're husband and wife, and they're having twins, twin boys. We have Esau and we have Jacob. And even when they're in the womb, the Bible says they're battling it out. There are two nations battling in your womb, Rebecca is told. It's crazy. Because when the first one is born, Esau, he comes out, and the scripture says he's all red and hairy. It's like, ugh, come on. Like, who wants to, who wants to give birth to a Chewbacca baby? Like, that's disgusting. That's disgusting. But Esau's born, and Jacob comes out right behind him, but Jacob is holding on to Esau's heel. How messed up is that? Like, 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 a baby is born and then another baby is holding the heel of the first. And this speaks very loudly of who Jacob would be as a person because Jacob would always be reaching for something that wasn't his. Always be reaching for status that wasn't his. Always be reaching for blessings that wasn't his. Always be reaching for things that just wasn't his. And I think a lot of us can relate to Jacob. Because God blessed Jacob with certain gifts. God bless you with certain gifts, but we lose sight of that and we want what Esau has. And the same thing happens right here in verse 29. Verse 29. Uh, It says, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And and real quick, uh, the Bible right before this talks about how Jacob is, is really good in and around the house. The Bible says he dwelled among the tents. And the Bible's really kind because that's a way of calling someone a mama's boy. He was, he, he dwelled among the tents, we'll say. But Esau was a skilled hunter, is, is what the Bible says. So Esau comes in and he's exhausted. Obviously he didn't get anything. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and he drank and rose and he went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. I've always thought the story is super dumb. I've always thought that would never happen. I I do believe it literally happened. It's in the Bible. I believe it happened, but it is hard for me to believe that that happened because how dumb is Esau? In in this context, just so you know, uh, the birthright is his inheritance and Isaac is rich. Jacob literally took Esau's inheritance from the rich dad for what? A bowl of soup. What is that? That's a bad trade. That's, a, that's an incredibly dumb thing to do. That's a bad trade. And so I want to give you kind of, kind of an example uh, about what a bad trade kind of looks like. Anyone in here with an iPhone? Anyone here have an iPhone? Go ahead, raise your hand. It's church. Get a little active. Get a little active. Yeah. Who has an iPhone 10? Who has the 10? Anyone? Help me out. It's dark in here. Is anyone raising their hand with a 10? Where are you? Where are you? Where? Where are we? No one? No hands? Where? Who is it? Who is it? Tell me your name. Chris, 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 I got a, I got a deal for you, Chris. You ready for this? For your one apple, I will give you eight great pieces of fruit, and one is a work in progress, but I will give you eight pieces of fruit for your one apple. That's a good deal, right? Okay, yeah, you're ruining my illustration over here, but you want to trade? No, no, why not? Why not? Go ahead, tell me. It's a bad deal, right? It's a bad deal. But, but, you know, if you were hungry enough, you may consider something so dumb, right? It's like, no, man, I got McDonald's app. They would deliver. But like, but, like, if you were hungry and you weren't thinking clearly, 
if you weren't thinking clearly, you may consider the trade. And so you would perhaps give up what's most important for what's most convenient. And that's what Esau does. And that's my first point to you tonight. Don't give up what's most important for what's most convenient. Why was Esau in this position? Why was he even in this position? We could say he lacked self-control. Come on, man. It's a bowl of soup for your inheritance. What are you doing? On the surface, we can laugh at Esau for making such a bad trade. But if we're really honest, I think we do the same thing all the time. Because this is how, many, this is how so many battles begin. This is how so many battles begin, whether we are trying to diet and exercise, read our devotion every day, or try to improve our lives. In some way, we often stop doing it for the sake of convenience, not importance. I mean, think about the times that you've tried to start working out more. Think of the times you've tried to better your life in some way. Convenience eventually wins. Why? Why do we do this? Esau gave up his inheritance from his rich dad. For what? Convenience, a bowl of soup. That's a bad deal. That's a bad trade. Esau gives up what's most important for what's most convenient. And listen, we do the same thing all the time. As a parent, I'm tempted to do this all the time. I have a three-year-old and a two-year-old and a soon-to-be little girl. My heart is a, my heart's a mess, guys. Oh, thank you. Pray for me. Um, I've heard I will only lose 10 years. Um, so, 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 but, but, but my little boys are great and they're also the worst because they're little boys, you know? And so sometimes I just want them to chill out and I just want to hand them a screen, right? There's PJ Masks on here. Come on, Netflix. Like, like, like there's, there's no weird ads on Netflix, you know? Like, like come on, come on, just, just give me a break. Give me 40 minutes, dudes. Help me out. But you know, who am I really serving? I'm serving myself when I do that, right? I'm serving myself. I'm not benefiting these little ones at all. I'm doing it for myself. That's selfish. It's for convenience, not importance. My boys are going to be three and two once. One time they will be that age. And we will never get it back. But for convenience and what I declare sanity, I excuse it. That's wrong. And so, and so, I want to give you kind of a, another bad example within my life. I have plenty of them. But right now, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in seminary. I'm, I'm getting my master's degree a couple years in. I have a couple more years ahead of me. And it's exhausting, but, but I enjoy it. And, and I've you know, developed some pretty good uh, study habits. I didn't always have good study habits. And so when I was working on my undergrad, I, I, I ran into this new thing. I ran into Netflix. And, and I was like a freshman in college or something. And I came across, you may remember this, cheer if you, if you remember this. I came across this great show called Lost. Yeah, see, you laugh, because you're like, yeah, it was really good. Until the end. But it was really good. And, and, and so listen, listen, I came across the show on Netflix and all six seasons were on there. And I found it in the middle of a semester. So what do you think happened to me that semester? Not good things, not good things. I made a bad trade, but I did the math. Six seasons of Lost, equates to 90 hours of content. Uh, your boy watched 90 hours of Lost in 14 days. <laughs> so dumb, so dumb. That, that equates to almost six and a half hours a day of Lost. Oh man, listen. Some days, was, there, there was less, but there was one Saturday. It was 12 straight hours. I just kept hitting go. I kept hitting go. Uh, life is tough when you're in college and you're single. Uh, but... But the reality is that was a bad trade because I ended up failing a class, barely passing another class and got C's in two other classes. And, and I had a scholarship, but you know, a scholarship has requirements and I had to call my dad and I had to talk to him about it. And, and you know, that class was $800, $800 just down the drain because I lacked self-control. They say, Life comes at you fast. You have a split second to make a decision. Well, on Netflix, they give you 10, and I still fumbled it. I still couldn't say no. Still, it just kept going. But, but, but listen, for the sake of convenience, we neglect what's most important. We neglect what's most important all the time for what's in front of us, for the first thing that we can reach for. And so, and so we do this all the time. And you know, Esau did this too. 
And, and I think he reassures himself uh, in the story. Uh, but listen, listen, whenever you think of, of your eating habits specifically and your physical health, uh, what do you tell yourself the third time you're in a drive through in a week? What do you tell yourself? I'm out of options. Couldn't have helped this. We say that, right? I think Esau said the same thing. I think Esau says, I, I was starving. I had to. I, I had to do it. I mean, in verse 32, listen, you can, almost, you can almost hear the emotion in Esau's voice. He says, listen, I'm about to die. Come, come on, come on, Esau. Get real, dude. Come on. I don't doubt that Esau believed it, though. I think he believed it. But, you know, he was starving himself physically, so what happened to him emotionally? It was exaggerated, right? Reality was exaggerated for him because he was starving himself physically, that emotionally, he couldn't quite keep it together. And so he believed, I'm about to die. Give me the red stew. I'll give you anything. Because we exaggerate our emotions when we're starving. And I'm talking about stomach starving, but I'm also talking about that heart hunger too. That longing in your heart. You starve yourself for so long. You get hungry and you reach for things that aren't yours. You fall into the past that, that you thought you were out of. That's what happens to you all the time. It happens to me. I get, by my own admission, listen, I get hangry all the time. Anyone else? Anyone else get hangry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, hanger is a blend of hunger and anger, and they mix together. So whenever I get really hungry, yes, I would probably punch someone for a baked potato if I'm hungry enough because, because potatoes are the best food source in the world. And so and so like, I, I just get so hungry that I get angry. My wife likes to poke at me. And so anyone here know someone who's hangry, right? Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You all know people who get hangry. I think my wife is in the back raising her hand. You're not funny. And I mean, she's telling the truth, but she's not funny. And so, but, but Esau, Esau thinks he's physically starving. When in reality, it's just exaggerated. It's just exaggerated. But we do the same thing. We do the same thing. And so maybe on the weekend, we go to church and we feel fired up, and we want to grow with God. Worship was great. I got a good word. Everything was wonderful. And so we choose, like, that's it. Monday morning, I'm getting back in my Bible. Even if it's just a verse a day, I'm getting back into it. Genesis 1-1, let's go. And then Monday comes, and something happens, right? Something always comes up. And then Tuesday comes, and you think, I'll double up. And then you wake up late, and then Wednesday kind of comes and you're like, well, you know, I'm already off to a bad start. Maybe I'll start next week. And so when Friday comes, you have starved yourself on food you got on Sunday. So, so, so of course you are susceptible to hunger on Friday. And so when you get the text, you up, you're, you're longing for love from God, but you settle for the cheap sex with someone else because you're, you're starving yourself through the week. We do this all the time, and we think that, that we should blame the church. Well, you know, the church, they didn't really like, do what they were supposed to do for me. When really, we're the ones starving ourselves. This right here, right now, is not meant to sustain you through the week. It's on you. It's on me. It's on me to cultivate our relationship with God. And so we want love, but we settle for cheap sex. We want to diet, but we settle for Krispy Kreme. We want to grow with God, but we settle for a weekend service. We lack self-control. We make a bad trade all the time, just like Esau. We make a bad trade that we thought we would never make. We would never do that. I would never think of doing something like that. And then years later, there we are. I'm sure Esau never thought he would give away his inheritance for, for food. Come on, Esau. But you know, we can, we can turn that mirror around on us. Come on, Kevin. Self-control. John Piper once said, you cannot love God and not listen to him. You cannot love God and not listen to him. In other words, you can't complain that you never hear from God if your Bible stays closed. If you can blow on it and you see dust come off, you, can't, you, you simply cannot complain that you're not growing with God if you're not putting in the effort. And, and listen, I, I, I wanna move on to my second point here uh, real quick. 
Because, because you have to make sacrifices. You simply have to make sacrifices if you want to grow with God. My second point is this. You, you've heard it a lot. You are what you eat. Second point, you are what you eat. In verse 34, it says that Esau, Esau ate and he left. He, he, just, he just sits down and he eats and he leaves. Nothing else to it. He didn't add spices to make it better. He didn't enjoy it with someone else. He ate and he left. Of course he left dissatisfied. What he ate was dissatisfying. His trade for it was dissatisfying. So many of us, we eat the wrong things. We, we watch the wrong stuff. We listen to the wrong things. We have bad diets all across the board. And we wonder why we're not growing with God. We are what we eat. I mean, I think of moments in my life whenever I, I feel like I'm, I'm far from God or my relationship with God is stale, it's dry, it's, it's just not what I want, it's not vibrant like it used to be. I want it to be what it used to be, but it simply isn't anymore. And, and listen, it's because I'm allowing certain influences in my life that don't point me to God, that don't point me to Jesus. And I have a great example for you. Listen, I'm a white boy from Kentucky, but I love rap. I love rap. I can't do it, but I love it. I just think I'm so impressed by it. When it's done well, I think it's so great. But outside of my boys, Lecrae, NF, Propaganda, Show Baraka, I'll listen to a little bit of Chance, a little bit of Kendrick, maybe one song of Kendrick. Outside of that, I will listen to almost nothing else because as a genre, it is very toxic. It's not good for me to listen to anything else, right? But so, 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 so I take the good stuff, right? And I try to feed myself with the good stuff, the stuff that points me to God, the stuff that, that helps me appreciate life more. But I don't, I don't want, no, no, Cardi B, you are talented, but not here. No, Nikki, you, you're talented, but I don't, I can appreciate you and not listen to you. Uh, that, that's just where I'm at. And I think that's where a lot of us are because you become what influences you most. You become what influences you most. You are what you eat. If we were really honest and we really thought about our friendships, we thought about our relationships even, I think for some of us, we surround ourselves with people who just do nothing but discourage us. But we have a history with them, so we don't want to let them down. We don't want to leave them. But they do nothing but just tear us down. They do nothing but gossip. They do nothing but talk poorly of other people. You need to surround yourself with better influences. And listen, I can feel a little pushback right now, even in this room, even through the video. It's weird. I can feel this little pushback because some of you are thinking to yourself right now, well, Pastor Kevin, that's not very pastoral of you judging people like that. Well, listen, <laughs> chill, chill. That's how you all sound in my head. <laughs> chill out because, because I know what you're thinking. You're thinking Jesus was around all the sinners and, and he was an influence bad and, and, and all these things. And, and this is what you're thinking. And, and you know, you're right. To a degree, you are right. But in John 15, 15, Jesus is clear of who his friends are, his disciples. Not perfect, but people, people who believed in the same goal, the same vision, the same God. They wanted to change the world together. And he could mostly trust them. Those were his people. That was his tribe. In fact, he even had best friends Peter, James, and John. John, by the way, makes it very apparent. Read his gospel. He's like, listen, I'm best friends with Jesus all the time. It's uh, aggravating. But Jesus surrounded himself with the right people. He, he went into the world, but he wasn't what? He wasn't of the world. He went into the world to influence the world, but most of his time was with his people. He was with his tribe. If that isn't the best plug for life groups or for you to serve in this church, I don't know what is. So yes, yes, it's true. Jesus ate with some of the worst people in the region, but he spent most of his time with the people who loved him and loved God. Even though Esau lacked self-control, I think, I'm convinced all Esau really needed was a good friend. I think all you need is a good friend to tell you that's a really dumb trade. You don't need to go out with him. What are you doing messing around with her? I think if Esau had a good friend, just come alongside him and just, and just say, man, that's a bad trait. What are you doing? What are you doing? Your dad's loaded. 
You know, like, 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 what are you doing? You're trading your inheritance for that. Come on, dude. Come on, man. Let's go get some food. Let's go do something together. All he needed was a good friend to tell him that was dumb. I think all I need is someone to tell me, Kevin, that's dumb. That's really dumb. Don't do that. I think that's all you need is really just someone that you can trust, someone who loves God, but loves you enough to tell you the truth. When that's dumb. I think Esau could have gotten out of the situation if he had someone in his life but he didn't, and, and he fell, he was deceived. He was starving, he was hungry, he was weak. And listen, you know, give it enough time, if you're not intentional, if you are not purposefully doing something about your overall health, the results will not be what you want. Give it enough time. What happens to your body if you continue to just eat poorly, refuse to exercise, and just sit and be lazy all day. It doesn't take long for your body to begin to deteriorate. And the quality of life is not what you wanted. A recent study uh, from the uh, Archives of General Psychiatry, they found that, um, sure, here's some physical uh, results that come from that in a sedentary lifestyle. You know, you're a greater risk for stroke, diabetes, Vision loss from complications, asthma, sleep apnea, kidney disease, blood clots, high blood pressure, and heart attack. But honestly, what I found to be the most troubling side effect, thus proving my thesis that what you do to one of these avenues affects all of them, is that if you live the sedentary lifestyle and you are inactive, that you have a 55% greater likelihood to develop depression. So a physical a physical effect will cross over and hinder your mental health. I'm telling you, they all matter. What happens to one happens to all of them. There's a ripple effect. It should change the way that we view things. Your mental health, as it turns out, is affected by your physical health. Uh, Paul is pretty uh, blunt here in 1 Corinthians. He says, do you not know that your bodies?" are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. I think we need to come back. I'm not saying that you gotta get shredded for Jesus. I mean, you know, ask your spouse. Maybe it wouldn't hurt, but, but you, don't have to get, you don't have to get shredded for Jesus. But like, I think that you should honor your temple. Absolutely. Because it does affect your physical health, your emotional health, your mental health, your spiritual health. It affects all that. But above all that, it honors God. It honors God for you to take your health seriously. We need to come back. And so if we listen to enough gossip, though, if we listen to enough gossip, what, what forms in us? A critical heart. The negative influences in our life form a critical heart. If we just mindlessly watch television all day, we develop a dull mind. The influences in our life, they just grow us. And before you know it, you've missed key moments in your life. Key moments when even, even God could be speaking to your heart, but you weren't taking it seriously. You were, you, you were listening to the wrong influences. You didn't take your overall health seriously. Esau is dissatisfied with his life choice. He gave away his inheritance because he chose a dissatisfying meal from someone he couldn't trust. Esau was hungry because he was weak. He, sorry, he was weak Esau was weak because he was hungry. And you have to be careful when you're weak, when you are weak, when I am weak, you have to be careful of the voices you listen to. Who did he confide in? The heel grabber. He confided in the one person that he should not have confided in. In his weakest moment, what happened? He gave in. You have to be aware of the people who are waiting to trip you up in your most vulnerable state. You have to listen to the right voices. Yes, you should be here at church. It's great that you're here. You should be involved. You should be plugged in. You should surround yourself with like-minded influencers because that matters. Otherwise, otherwise, in times of great hunger, you will reach for that quick fix. You will reach for the first thing that's offered to you because you're starving yourself. 
You're starving yourself. I hope you're picking up that this is just an analogy for food because I'm really talking about your heart right now because I want you to know that God wants you to grow. He wants more for your life than where you are right now, but we're settling and we're just starving and we look at the donut and we think that seems good, that seems nice, and after we do it, we knock out a half dozen more and we're just dissatisfied. Just like Esau, we gave our life away. We settle for Bible verses that fit our situation, too. We will, we will settle for Bible verses that gloss over the fact that we should be slow to speak and quick to listen. We will look over Bible verses that, that tell us that we should love our enemies and pray for them. We, we, argh, that doesn't fit my life. We will even look over the parts of the Bible where Jesus says, like, uh, as you judge your brother, so you will be judged. We, uh, we don't like it, it doesn't fit, but listen, what you really need is a healthy diet of a whole Bible, not just picking and choosing because the gospel is not a buffet. It is a pill and it is a tough pill to swallow. You don't get to pick and choose what you want out of the Bible. You accept it or you don't. You follow Jesus or you don't. People talking about CrossFit, I'll show you CrossFit. It's, it's cheesy, I don't care. You want, to talk about, you want to talk about fruits of the Spirit? Let's talk about love. Let's talk about love. How we are to embody love. How, how, how we should be people of great grace. We should be people of joy. We should be people who seek peace. And we should be people who are patient and kind. And we should be good. We should be faithful. We should be gentle. And we should demonstrate self-control. If I were to ask the people closest to you in your life, would they use any of those adjectives? Would they, would they say, that's definitely you? If not, if not, then my third point is for you. And I'm speaking to myself because I'm not all of those things. Not at all. My third point, and I want to give Steph Curry credit. He helped me with this one. He and I are tight. He and I are tight. Third point, train your mind and your body will follow. Actually, Steph, I'm going to change it. Train your mind and your life will follow. Train your mind and your life will follow. Because, because here's the thing. If you train your mind, if you train your mind, your, your body will follow. Your life will follow. By this, I mean, don't pay attention to this. I know it's easy because maybe sometimes it looks bigger than other things. Like, like it's fine. Don't pay attention to this. Don't pay attention to this this, whatever you're trying to work on in your life. Don't pay attention to it. No, you're fighting the wrong battles. You think, well, if I train my body and if I can hit 50 push-ups a day, if I can do this, if I can do that, no. You see, you're fighting the wrong battles because the battle starts up here and it's a decision you make up here. If you don't believe me, listen, I'm gonna bring a Bible verse into this and you can't refute the Bible. Do not, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the what? renewing of your mind. So it's saying, the Bible says, don't eat like the world eats. Don't, don't be influenced by everything that the world tells you is good. Don't, don't grab all the things that the world tells you you should grab and you should stand for and you should believe in. You're focused on the wrong, on the wrong things. For many of us, we're fighting the wrong battles. We're fighting the wrong way even. And I, and I have a, a perfect, a perfect story that you can laugh at my expense over this one. I have a perfect story to prove this. Because for so many of us, we, we think if I don't sin, if I focus on not doing it, I won't do it. And that's just simply not true. That's simply not true. And I'm going to prove this to you. I'm like six or seven years old and I'm learning to ride a bike. And, and not to be braggadocious, but I was really good at pedaling and I was really good at the balance. It was the steering that got me, you know, kind of like crazy. And so I'll never forget going down this huge hill. It seemed big at the time. I've been back. It's not that big. But it seemed so big. And there's a stop sign about 100 yards on the other side of the road. And I start on this, you know, I start on, on the left side, my left side. And I start going down the hill. And it's not that big of a hill, so I'm still kind of pedaling, doing my own thing. And also, like, like the stop sign just kind of comes to, my, comes to mind. I just see it. It's far away, but it's still there. And I just think, like, wow, I don't want to hit the stop sign. I don't want to hit it. 
And then you know what happened? It's all I could think about. Like, it was like, it was keeping me up at night. It just was like there. And then all of a sudden, like, it's all I'm staring at. And so I'm just like pedaling my bike, little six-year-old big-headed Kevin. And so I'm just like, I don't want to hit the stop sign. Like, I'm at the perfect level where it will just like decapitate me or something. And then all of a sudden, I'm just 50 yards away. And look, look where I'm at. I'm in the middle of the road. I went from there to here and the stop sign is there because I'm fixated on the stop sign. And so the next 50 yards, it's all I can see. It's all I can stare. I'm just like, I don't want to hit it. I don't want to hit it. I don't want to hit it. So what happened? Of, of, of course, of course I hit it. It's all I thought about. I didn't want to do it. But we treat sin, we treat our struggle the same way. I don't want to look at porn. I don't want to look at porn. I don't want to look at porn. And you know, you can get by on that for what? A few days. But if you're just focused on not doing something, it will come back. It will always come back. I want to be a better spouse. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. I don't, I don't want to fail in my marriage. I don't want to be who I used to be. If that's all you're focusing on, you're not improving. If you, if, if you don't want to blow up at your family over the small stuff anymore, you have to train your mind to think differently. You have to train your mind to think differently. And so if you want to stop looking at porn, I would recommend start reading. Shoot, start exercising. Get your blood pumping in a different way. If you want to stop failing as a husband or a wife, start doing things for them and expect nothing in return. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's like, it's like you're dating again or something. But start doing something for them and don't expect anything in return. In fact, what if you... It's crazy. It's crazy. What if you stopped holding the mistakes of their past against them and instead of worrying and focusing on all those years lost because that thing happened. What if you chose like, no, I'm not living in the past anymore. I have years ahead and we're gonna make it, honey. We're gonna do something different because God has given me something else and I have something else to work towards. Or maybe, maybe you have anger issues. Maybe you have anger issues. I have anger issues. I wanna tell you that right now. I got some anger in me. But the reality is we use the excuse, I just have a bad temper. That's bogus. That is bogus. Bad tempers do not exist. You don't deal with your issues. I know because I don't deal with my issues. And I want to say I have a bad temper. My counselor has advised me otherwise. Y'all think I'm perfect or something. Who are you? Gosh, come on. I'm a person just like you. The reality is though, we are influenced by our greatest, we become our greatest influences. But to put it simply, trash in, trash out. You eat trash, you put out trash. You consume trash, you put out trash. Your life, I don't know if you know this or not, your life is already being lived. Your life is, is passing you by right now. And you think one day I'll do this. One day I'd like to do that. And we excuse things away. Your life is being lived right now. So what, what direction is it going? Where are you going to end up? Because, because you're living for convenience and being influenced by the wrong things. So you're not living with passion, you're not living with purpose, and you're not living with persistence. I'm a pastor, I like alliteration, and it's also helpful to help you remember that you have a purpose and it comes from God, and that you should be passionate about it, and you should live for it, and you should give your life for it, and then you should be persistent because when you get knocked down and punched in the stomach, you gotta get back up and say, no, I have a purpose that I'm passionate about, and I will be persistent. Your life, your life is going in a direction right now. Where's it going? Trash in, trash out. And now listen, I know this is a hard topic to talk about. I'm trying to incorporate the spirituality of food, let's, let's just say it, and physical health, but I know it's, 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 it's an offensive topic to talk about. It's hard to talk about. And I know if you are so upset with me, I really hope you would hear my heart. And then I'm just, I'm just trying to point you to Jesus. I'm just trying to, to, to show you that you can honor God with your physical health. But if you are so angry with me, then you can send all your hate mail to me directly, personally, please. Uh, my email address is pastorjeremy at metrocitychurch.com. That is with a capital J, by the way. 
Uh, now, 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 listen, listen. Jokes aside, you should know a joke's coming. Jokes aside, bear with me for a second. I thought about not saying this, because this is kind of like edgy. Your pastor's being edgy today. When Esau, when Esau ate the food, where did it end up? Where did it end up? See, these are the things that I think about through the week while you're actually contributing to society. These are the things that... (laughs) Y'all think I'm like doing deep Bible study, like God, you know, and no, I'm not thinking of that. But I say that because, listen, I say that because you make decisions every single day and your body will just process it no matter what. You will respond to it no matter what. You will react to it no matter what. But if we're honest, life is incredibly short. You are a mist and you appear for a short, short while and then you are gone. The decisions you make affect you. No matter what you consume with your heart or your stomach, with your life, Your body can adapt, but only for so long. We should be people who live for quality. Quality, a quality life. A quality life is what I believe God intends for us. I didn't say quantity, because God can call us to live short lives. He can call us to live long lives. But I think God wants quality for you. I think he wants you to have a healthy lifestyle a healthy mind, healthy heart, healthy soul, a healthy body. I firmly believe God wants that out of you and for you. In his book, Wild at Heart, John Eldridge puts it really simply. He tells a story. He used to live by a zoo, and he says some nights he would hear the local lion roar, and he thought it was awesome. Wow, a lion. I can hear it from my backyard. He thought it was so cool because, you know, when you think of a lion, you think tough, you think fierce, you think of a a lion. But he he, he takes his kids to the zoo and he sees this lion and the lion is just laying there. And he sits there for a long time and he just watches the lion and the lion doesn't move. It doesn't move, it's just sitting there. Flicks its tail, it flies, its its ears and everything. It's just sitting there. And finally he makes eye contact with the lion and, and he says he just gets down he's just staring at this lion and he stares into its eyes and he says it was the weirdest thing. What he thought was fierce, what he thought was this roar that was big and and terrifying, he looked into this lion's eyes and he saw sorrow. He said it was weird, it's an animal. But I saw it it wanted something else than this caged life. It did not want to be held back It's a lion. It was meant for the fields. It was meant for something bigger. You were made for something better. You were made for something bigger. And so he's staring at this lion and he just, his heart goes out to it because it's not living its purpose. It's not living a quality life. He goes home that night and he's in the backyard and what does he hear? He hears the same roar he's always heard, but he has a different context for it now because he saw the lion for himself and he knows that that lion is not living for quality, it's not living its purpose. He hears the roar, but he says that roar is a longing for a different life. That lion was not meant to be put in a cage. That lion wants out, it wants more out of life. Don't you want more out of life than your struggle? Don't you want out of this life quality? Uh, Poet Ed Sisman put it this way. He said, men past 40, this, by the way, this is for men and women. But, but in, the poet, in the poem, he says, men past 40 get up nights, look out at city lights, and wonder where they made the wrong turn and why life is so long. You want to know why midlife crisis is real? It's because you're not living with a quality life. You're not living with purpose. You've, you've made bad trades your whole life, and it's finally caught up to you, and you are completely dissatisfied with where you are 
I can talk about your stomach all I want, but I'm trying to tell you about your heart. You need a different diet. You need to change some patterns in your life. You need to train your mind to do something different. If you're here today and you've lost your passion and you feel like life is blowing by you, that you've lost your purpose, then you need to come back. You need a real comeback. This life moves forward with or without you and one day you will look back and you will smile for the life you lived or you will groan for the mistakes you made and the life you could have lived. You will not one day look back and think, I wish I would have posted more on Instagram. I wish I would have spent more time on my newsfeed on Facebook. I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have put a screen for my kid just a little more. You won't want that. No. God wants quality for you. He made you with passion. He made you with purpose. It's up to us to be persistent. We have to take our health seriously. Our physical health, our mental health, emotional spiritual it all connects and we have to do so with self control we cannot reach for these quick fixes any longer we have to put in the time we have to put in the effort we have to spend every morning with the word of God in front of us and listen I I, I try to do it as much as I can I try to sit down in front of my boys every single morning and I try to read my Bible I want them to see their dad is engaged in the word. But you know, sometimes it gets the best of me. Sometimes things come up. Sometimes I preach on a Saturday. It's a Saturday I wake up and I don't open my Bible first thing. I'm telling you right now, I did not get up this morning and I did not read my Bible. I got to work on a message about the Bible and I tried, I tried to make a bad trade. I'm telling you that because if I'm not perfect, why would you expect yourself to be perfect? So on the way here, I kid you not, I kid you not, on the way here, someone cuts me off in traffic. I told you I got a bad temper. I followed the person on the way to church to teach you all about self-control. Isn't that ironic? I think to myself, that's so stupid. What am I doing? I starve myself. It hit me. I starved myself this morning. Of course I messed up. Well, what would I expect? I didn't start in the word. So I responded with an exaggerated emotion. We need to be people, we need people who are fed well through the week. And so maybe tomorrow you start something with a different spirit inside of you, with a different heart toward it. Listen, don't give up what's most important for what's most convenient. You may be what you eat, then get a healthy diet. Train your mind and your life will follow.